wouldn't you stand to your feet this morning? One thing I love about the body of Christ is even though we're up here leading worship, it doesn't mean that just, just one of us up here has a word. It means that we can all encourage one another. And so um, Mrs. Baker has a word for us this morning and she said, I just really feel like I need to share it this morning. It has to do with worship and I'd like to share it before we get started. And so just have an open heart as she shares. You know, um, closer. been really worshiping the Lord this week and um, you know he I love the Old Testament and in the Old Testament there's this part where the uh, four horns are sent out and they're the four horns of destruction and when that happened our father says send out the craftsmen and you know craftsmen are people with talents and gifts I think we have the best worship team. And also in the Old Testament, you know, when Israel was surrounded by armies, King Jehoshaphat said, let's worship. Let's praise our Father. And I guess that's where I want to encourage you guys. If you guys are going through anything, if you're having hard times, remember it's worshiping. It's bringing your heart before our Father and just praising Him. That's when miracles can happen. Because remember, when the Israelites woke up that next morning, the armies were dead. And never forget that it was a shout that took down the walls of Jericho. So just worship this morning. Bring your hearts before Him, and He's going to take care of all of you. we just prepare our hearts just as she said this morning Lord we're going to lay it all at your feet because we know that God you have it all under control you know this first song we're going to sing is fierce and it talks about the fierce love of our father that he has for us and it just says, it's basically a cry saying, Lord, overtake us with your love this morning like a hurricane, something that tears through the atmosphere, something that we can't deny. And Lord God, that's our cry for this morning, God. We just want to experience your love maybe in a new way for, for us this morning, maybe in a way that we haven't felt in a long time. Lord God, you know where each one of us is at and you know what each one of us needs. And so, Lord, I thank you that you can meet each one of us where we're at, Father. So, um... I love that she said she loves the Old Testament because that's where I've been hanging out the last few weeks. Um, I asked the Lord to just kind of reveal a whole new story in the Old Testament to me as I spend time with Jesus in that word. And um, I'm walking through the process of, I think I told you last week, through the whole battle of Jericho and God giving the cities and re reaffirming the promised land and everything that God had promised the Israelites. And of course, the story continues on after they take the city of Jericho, right? And they continue in the next city they're supposed to take is um, Ai. So they go to Ai and the command in that was that they were going to be handed the city of Ai, but they were not to take anything that from that uh, city. 
they were supposed to burn it all and consecrate it all before the Lord. They weren't supposed to hold any of the things they found, the gold, the jewels, uh, the plunder, basically. They were supposed to just destroy every bit of it. And so obviously they go in, they take the city, and Achan decides that he wants to keep some of it. So he takes it, and he hides it in a tent. And obviously the blessing of the Lord gets removed from the Israelites at this moment. So they go, and they um, obviously they go to take the city, and it doesn't happen. They're like, what the heck's going on, God? You said that this was ours. Why are we, that this was ours? Why are we hit in opposition here. Why are we not able to take this? Well, then the Lord reveals to Joshua what's going on, that Achan and his family line decided they were going to take some of the plunder and some of the amazing treasures they found, and they were going to hide it. Well, that removed the blessing of the Lord from their purpose. Okay, so everyone in this room say purpose with me. Say purpose. Come on, say it. Purpose. All right. So what happens in worship when we come we find out, we get this amazing picture of who we are in Christ, right? We're saying, God, we're your kids. We get to worship you. We have the ability to play music and sing and dance and shout and worship. But some of us like to hold back. Okay, you guys tracking with me for a minute? We like to hold back the amazing things that we found from God. So when we come to worship and give everything we have, we hold things back. But what that does is it actually removes the blessing of your purpose in this moment. You don't get to fully experience what worshiping Jesus is all about if you don't go all in. Everyone say all in. So I wanna encourage you today, listen. Of course, if you read in that story, what happens is God told Joshua, you need to kill Achan and his family line, just kill him. You're not gonna get killed in church this morning if you don't go all in. But what I will say this morning is if you don't go all in, in worship, you're gonna miss out on the blessing and the purpose that God has on your life in this moment. This isn't about tomorrow. This isn't about yesterday. This is about the here and now moment with Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. Say this is about me and Jesus. Okay, this isn't about your neighbor. This isn't about what they think if you're dancing. This isn't about what they think if you sing on key. This is about you and Jesus. Don't worry. We can drown out the voices if we have to. We can crank it up. I can just look at Alex and he'll just send it. All right? The whole town will hear nothing but the whole congregation. All right? Do you guys realize that when you sing, whether it's on key or off key, when we sing as a group, as a congregation, it's a beautiful noise? Have you ever just listened? It's an amazing thing. And you're part of that. So this morning, don't hold back. This morning, we're going to be fiercely in love with Jesus. Everyone say fiercely. Look at your neighbor say, I am fiercely in love with Jesus. See, no shame in your game, right? All right, so we're going all in. We're not holding back. We're going all in to experience the blessing of worship with Jesus this morning. All right, church? You guys with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? Yeah. There we go. Here we go. Don't. 
wonderful story going around for the past few weeks. I don't know if you've heard it, but the head of the Satanist church, or one of the founders of the Satanist church in South Africa, a few weeks ago, came to know Jesus. He said for years, Christians had treated him like garbage because of the way he looked and what he did. But there were a couple times that a few people just showed him love. And most recently, there was a woman who just came and gave him a hug and said, I love you when Jesus loves you. And he said instantly he felt an overwhelming amount of love that he had never felt before. And he didn't know what to do with it. So later on that week, he goes and meets with other Satanists and they have a ritual. And he goes deeper into his studies and has a ritual with himself. Is okay, how do I get more power? And the Holy Spirit came to him and says, love. And just hit him with so much love, he began weeping that he had never felt this before in his life other than when this lady hugged him and, and this amount of power that came to him because the love of Christ hit his life it was he couldn't explain it and he gave his life to God on the floor there renounced Satanism and then he did it publicly he's like I renounce Satanism I am serving Christ now and he's not doing it for power but he's doing it because he met the all-powerful one because God loved him don't feel like you're unlovable because of what you've undone <laughs> you may have you might be in here and have been a Satanist I don't judge you for that I don't care where you came from because I know who created you I know who still loves you I know who is still reaching out for you and will still reach out for you till your last breath you are lovable. You are worthy of being loved. 
His love will hit you like a tidal wave if you let it. He won't force it on you. But if you want more, he has it for you. Chase me down. Seek me out. How can I be lost when you have called me found? You chase me down. You seek me
One thing I want to just establish real quick is Scripture is pretty clear. We receive not because we do not ask, right? We get what we ask for. And when you consider our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father's heart for you is increase, right? Spiritually, emotionally, physically. And so I heard one time, it was an individual worship pastor actually was asked, What's your goal for Sunday morning? And he says, my goal every single Sunday is to get something from God I've never seen before. Well, wait a second. Get something from God we've never seen before. How many people have ever, have you ever heard him say, well, if we could just have like an Azusa Street Revival. I don't want an Azusa Street Revival because this is an Azusa Street. But what we do is we sit there and we draw a line and we set a bar and say, if we could make this point, then we've made it. But my prayer this morning, and then this is it, God, let us see something today we've never seen. God, let us go to a place we've never been. God, every Sunday we will seek for you to bring something that is new, fresh, and relevant into our lives. 
God, we pursue you. We ask so we can receive. And God, I just pray that if, if, if you're in this place today, and, and maybe it's subconsciously, but you're still punching the time card, the church time card, I want, I'm giving you permission to tear up the time card. You're not an employee. You're not subservient. You're part of the family and part of the team, which means that God has something for you today, for you, specifically for you. When I was a kid, it, it was said it's impossible to do a backflip on a motorcycle. Impossible. You're going to kill yourself. And there was a young man named Travis Pastrana that said, I think you can do a backflip on a motorcycle. Did you know that it's not even really even a, a, a used trick anymore because it's so simple now? Why? Because someone said, that's possible and I'm going to do it. And I think as Christians, I think we've limited God's power so much that we need to start sitting there going, what is possible with God? And what can he do? So as we go back into worship, I would challenge you to start thinking on those lines. God, what is possible and what can you do? And let's see what happens when God shows up. Day. 
Exalted. Because you are in all and through all and for all this morning, Jesus. So God, as we sing, everything is for you this morning. Jesus, receive it as an incense, as a sweet incense of praise and worship coming from your people. And Father, as these praises begin to just continue to accumulate, in the heavenly realm this morning, God, I pray that the blessings of heaven would be poured out over Wheatland, Wyoming this morning. Because your people have humbled themselves and gave everything they had in worship this morning, God, blessings be poured out over this church, over these people in this place, over the people of Platte County, whether they're in this room or not. God, we want to see your blessings fall on a town that needs Jesus in a real way. And God, I'm not just talking about little blessings here and there, little loaves of bread in the, in the bread boxes and little things happening in the fridge. But God, I pray that an overwhelming abundance of power and wealth and prosperity would be poured over the Platte County right now. God, I pray that Platte County would be the leading county in Wyoming that would lead a people back to you. God, that it would start in the hearts of your people in every church in Wheatland this morning. Not just one, but every. God, you are assembling tribes to move through this land. You are assembling your people by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands across the U.S. So God, thank you we get to call you daddy thank you that we get to call you ours thank you that we get to partner with what you're doing this morning you are worthy of it all Lord. I'd just like to say 
how much I admire this youth group. And I admire, what I admire most about you is your dedication and your commitment to Christ. It just blesses me. And I want to tell you something that happened to me when I was about your age or younger. I was 14 years old, and I had just become a Christian a couple months earlier. And because a revival had come to town, they a lot more people were going to the church. They didn't have room for the people in the church, so they were building a new church. And of course, I wanted to help build the church. <laughs> so they gave me the job of mixing the mortar, and uh, the church had the walls up already, and they had a supporting pillar on that wall, and on the top of that was called a capstone. Apologies. <laughs> Anyway, this capstone was a cement uh, block, but it was just a wedge-shaped thing, triangular. And it wasn't uh, cemented down, and uh, I was down right below it, mixing this concrete. And that thing slipped off of there, and it came right down, and the point of that thing hit me right in the middle of my leg, my knee and my ankle. And it knocked me flat on my back. And I thought, this isn't good. <laughs> And I looked at it, and the bone was sticking through the, the leg. And I thought, oh, boy. Now, the men of the church were working in the evenings, and they, uh, the women were in there preparing the meal. And one of those women was a registered nurse. She worked at the hospital. Now, my mom worked at the hospital, too. She was in the laundry, but they knew each other. Well, anyway, we had just got a new pastor, a great man of faith. And uh, every time I lifted that leg up a little bit, I could feel it coming apart, and it was hurting a lot. And uh, he's, they put me in a car to take me to the hospital, and he came out and he said, hey, let's at least pray for him before you haul him off to the hospital. <laughs> and so they got me out of there, and we were in the parking lot of the church, and, and they were holding me up, and he prayed for me, and he said, uh, do you have faith in Jesus? And I said, sure. And he said, well, do you have enough faith to start running? And I said, yeah. I was just, I just was, I didn't know enough to be afraid. So I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and so I lifted that leg up to go, and I could feel it coming apart. And I thought, no, I'm going to do this. And that leg came down, and as soon as that hit the pavement, I could feel electricity going through that leg right there, just a big electricity charge. And I started running and running and running, and I was running, and everybody was just, woo! <laughs> because when the Holy Ghost comes, and I, I say Holy Ghost like they used to, <laughs> and now it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but it was the Holy Ghost when I was younger. <laughs> and when the Holy Ghost comes, you don't yawn. You do stuff. <laughs> you get excited. It's just a, a great, it's just a great thing. And so, anyway, uh, I went home and told my mom about it. And she said, well, let me see it. And I pulled up my pant leg, and there was a spot on there about as big as a dime, and it was kind of pink. And she said, well, it's not a break. She said, you're goofy. I said, no, it was the bone was sticking out. She said, couldn't have been. My mom wasn't a Christian. She didn't know anything about that. And so she went to work the next day, and the nurse that was up there at the, at the thing, they saw the thing, and one, the one that wanted to take me to the hospital, she said, did your son tell you about the miracle he had of getting a broken leg healed? My mom said, well, he showed me a spot on his leg, but it was no gash or anything. She said, it was. It was a big break. And we were going to take him to the hospital. And he got healed. They prayed for him, and he got healed. And he was running around. And that was a miracle. <laughs> it was. And I really, I really just, oh, I was, I was so turned on to that, you know, and I wanted to tell the whole world. <laughs> so I had some friends, and they weren't Christians. And I said, you know what? The Bible says, um, not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And I can't be friends with you guys because you're not Christians. 
And I said, well, what do we do? I said, get down on your knees. <laughs> Start praying. <laughs> I don't know how sincere they were, but later on I found out when one of them passed away, he said to make, he told his wife to make sure you tell Wayne that I accepted the Christ and I'm in heaven. I'm going to heaven. And he passed away and he went to be with the Lord. And a couple of the other ones eventually did also. So there's power in the use. There's power. You guys have power. Uh, you guys prayed for me after I had the COVID. My heart was out of rhythm and I wasn't feeling well. And they come up here and you guys really, really prayed. You didn't just say, mm -hmm. you guys, yes, come on. Hallelujah. And, you know, and it worked just that quick. It was all, all right again. You guys have power. Don't forget that. Amen. When we have a testimony, it's us saying, God, do it again. You've done it. You can do it. Do it again. That's awesome. God is good, isn't he? It's a beautiful morning. So I'm going to do this. Uh, if I could get some lights on in the house. I want everyone to pull out your phone. He just said that miracle brought his mother to Christ. Absolutely. Amen. So good. Okay. So if you have your phone, I want you to open up the Impact app. If you're like, what's the Impact app? Never gotten it. Go to the, your Impact store, the app store and go to Impact WY. Ministries or Impact Ministries WY, and you'll find it. But if you open it up, on the front tiles there, you're going to see a tile that says Impact wants, to get, wants you to get prepared. And I want to just give you guys, and, and I'm not trying to scare anyone, but how many people have been following the news about the food distribution facilities, the farms, and everything that have been burning? Um, so if, if we've had half a dozen in the country... We call that a coincidence. We've almost broken 100 in six months. This is planned, orchestrated, and carried out. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist in any way, shape, or form, so please don't brand me as that. But I will say this. They are destroying the food structure of this country to the point now that mainstream media is even saying there's going to be food shortages and there's going to be famine in the country. And I don't believe in fear. I don't give fear any place in my life. But I also know this. God sends Joseph's to Egypt's. So there are times where we need to go and we need to make some grain bends and save some grain. And so we, we put together a, just a very simple, hey, why don't you figure out how to have a little extra food and a little extra water just to take care of yourself. How many people know when you get 48 inches of snow, it's hard to go find some food, eh? Right? Well, if there was actually something that hits in this case, it would be bad. And I don't want anyone, especially us here at Impact, to find ourselves in a place where we aren't prepared to take care of this situation. Amen? So look at it. It's super simple. You don't have to go and take out a reverse mortgage on your house to buy food. But you can do some wise things and how you can do them so that you are prepared in case of a food shortage. Sound good? Okay. If you could do that, that would be amazing. And Kristen, thank you for all your work on that. It's amazing. Okay. I wanted to get that out there. With that, I'm going to dismiss Kids to Impact Kids Church. As the kids are being dismissed, I got something for you. Next week, you must bring this type of Bible, a real one. It's got to have paper in it, a real paper Bible next week, okay? I, and I'm fine with you being on your phone with your Bible and stuff, but next week you got to bring a paper Bible, okay? If you don't have a paper Bible, you got to find me, and we'll get you a paper Bible. But you'll need a paper Bible next week. I'm not telling you why. Suspense is good, but you need to get a paper Bible. Make sure it's here. Amen? Okay. So if I said the term forerunner, 
visionary, trendsetter, what do you think of? TikTok. Okay, TikTok. What else? John the Baptist. When, when I say visionary, trendsetter, Jesus. He was. Forerunner. How many people have ever heard of a forerunner generation? It's a generation that is willing to go where no man has gone before, right? It's someone who's sitting there saying, hey, you know what? I'm not okay with where we're at. I had an individual the other day that said, I just can't wait till we can get back to normal. And I said, why would we want normal? You thought it was good? You thought that was proper? We had an apathetic sleeping church, a comfort zone ridden society. I'm not saying that I like what COVID brought us, but I do love this. People are waking up and we are actually turning into forerunners. It took something. How many people know that comfort is the worst enemy of progress? Right? You know what? I've, I, there was one individual I was listening to once, and he said that he knew that he couldn't accomplish the goal set before him with the distractions of his life, so he literally destroyed his phone, unplugged his television, and threw it out his window. Why? Because he said, I, I can't live with the distractions around me and be able to do what I need to do. And so this morning, I want to talk about a two-fold sermon concept of a forerunner generation who are trendsetters and how we can accomplish that and be Christians at the same time. Sound good? Okay. So if you have your scriptures this morning, I want you to open up to Ephesians 6. One, and you might be like, you're going to shift gears completely here, and it's going to be in a different direction. And that is true, but I believe you need to build the building blocks or the foundation to get the outcome that we want. Amen? Okay, so today, the basis of the conversation is going to be surrounding a simple word, and that word is honor. Everyone say it, honor. Okay, the definition of honor by the Webster's in the verb form regard with great respect. In the noun form, it's high respect or great esteem. So then I pulled respect up so we can get a little bit more of a down, uh, lower a view of this. And it says a feeling of deep admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. To admire someone or something deeply as a result of their abilities, qualities, or achievements. So if we talk about honor, one of the things you need to understand is if we're going to shift culture in America, we can do it in one of two ways. Right? Think about this. Shifting culture, you can either do it in a forceful manner where you do not care about the feelings or the heart or thoughts of an individual, or you can do it in the way where you bring honor into the equation and say, hey, we have a direction that God's calling us to go into, and I'm going to bring you along on the journey of a culture shift, but we're going to do it in a way that's honoring. Last night, I had the opportunity to be in Goshen Hole with a number of candidates that are running for political offices around the state, uh, one, a couple of which are ours, uh, Tony Goulart and Scott Smith. And I was able to MC the, the evening. And as I was going through that, one of the things I mentioned, and it's something that I've been talking about, is the fact that for so long the conservative movement in America has been so concerned about offending people, they've not had any action of change. Right? Well, I don't want to do that because it can be offensive. I don't want to do that because I'm supposed to be loving. How many people understand that acceptance of lies isn't love? I'm, wow. Okay. Acceptance of lies isn't love. That's not loving. If we look at the life of Jesus, what did Jesus do with people? He told the truth. He did it in honor. We can, we can say honor or love because in a lot of ways, they're synonymous. But what you do is this. Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, hey, stand up. Where are your accusers? They're not around anymore. 
well, neither do I accuse you, but go and sin no more. Right? He didn't say, hey, you know what? Your lifestyle is a lifestyle that that is really good, and and I I don't want to offend you, so I'm going to just be like, hey, you know what? I know you're sleeping around, and it's okay. I know that you have one of the 68 pronouns, or nouns, I mean, for your gender. It's okay. Oh, I know that I know that you you think that it's uh, that it's okay to abort babies, you know, it, and then it's okay. We live in a world where we are supposed to be the truth and, and the love of Jesus to a lost and dying world around us, and Jesus never once said, "Hey, it's okay." No, He said, "Guess what? You are free. You are forgiven. Now go and shift your lifestyle." He didn't condemn them. He didn't beat them up. The only people that Jesus beat up were Pharisees. It was just the church folk. If Jesus came back today, as he did in the first century, do you think that Jesus would do the same thing today? I bet you we wouldn't find Jesus here. I bet we'd find him next door. If we found him here, the sermon he'd be preaching would be one we wouldn't want to listen to. Right? That's a little too intense. So if we're talking about trend-setting or culture-shifting generations, one thing you need to understand is this. As God is calling us to be that people and in that place, we need to understand that honor is the way we do it. How many people believe that we are in a politically charged environment right now if you if you don't know that you can crawl out from underneath whatever rock you're under and realize that's the truth and the thing that I found interesting is in the last 10 years I will say five years it shifted it used to be a deal where I could be like hey Wayne we'll just agree to to disagree on this topic but that's gone now You can't agree to disagree. You make the post and you get unfriended. You make the statement, you get canceled. Right? We'll just cancel you from the culture. You you stand up for truth and then you get destroyed by the haters. And so how do we start setting a trend or shift a culture or how do we become a forerunner generation in a world that is not open to shift of change in culture? The answer is honor. In Philippians 2, 3, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. And then it goes on in Exodus 20, 12, it says, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. And then Ephesians, where I I sent you guys, also has a statement there about honor. And I know this doesn't fully apply to shifting culture in the world, but it's the foundation that we need to understand. So it says this in 6.1, everyone in this place who's a, a child, this front row here in space throughout, listen to this very clearly. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. But then it goes a step further because all the parents are like, yeah, did you hear that? But then it says this. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up and train them and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. You know, my my wife found this last week, a book series that they're kids' books. They're they're. They're simple. They come with this really cool wall map. It's like this grand adventure book series, right? And they came in the mail. I found them this morning on the porch. She told them about me about them. But if we're being very honest, don't tell her I said this, but, uh, but I wasn't really paying attention to what she was saying when she told me about them. But I opened the box, and I started looking at them. And the book that I read this morning, I thumbed through. I didn't read all of it, but this book was talking about don't take my coconut cannons. And it's the story of the hyenas that come and, and attack the uh, mushroom village and steal their cupcakes every day. 
and half the town says, well, if we just put up signs that say no coconut cannons, then the hyenas won't be able to steal our, co- or our, our cupcakes anymore. The other half of the town says, no, that doesn't make sense because our cannons are the only thing that can protect us from the hyenas. So the one side says, uh, everyone better carry a gun or a coconut cannon. The other side said, no coconut cannons. And the people said, well, the, the signs will protect us. Do you, get, do you get where I'm going, you guys? We're teaching our kids, what is it called? Worldview. As I'm looking at this, I'm like, brilliance, why? Because we're seeing, if we're talking about forerunner generations and shifting cultures, where do we start? In our kids. In the kids back there, the 45 that just walked out of this room, that's where we start teaching things. So the titles of the books talk about, you know what? The coconut cannons, it's, it's our Second Amendment rights. There's one about all lives matter, basically, and it's talking about abortion. There's talking about that, what was the one? Butterflies and elephants aren't birds, and birds aren't elephants. And you guys, we, we're giving these to every one of our nieces and nephews for their birthdays. Why? Because it's the best gift you could give to a kid, to give them a worldview. One that isn't jacked up by a public education system that doesn't want your kids to actually become a proper part of society. They want them to be a dependence upon the government. That's what we're dealing with, you guys. And I'm not bashing anything here. I'm simply telling the truth. Why is this so important? Because as we talk about trend setting and honor, we need to understand that we need to be honest and we need to be honoring as we do it. So kids, where does it start, this honor concept? It starts in the house. Parents, where does it start? It starts in the house. If you can't honor your kids, parents, why, do, why in the world should you expect them to honor you? I heard one time, I love it. Well, I'll honor him when he honors me. Oh, really, parent? Grow up. Really, grow up. No, you show honor, and honor is shown. So the first sphere that this honor aspect has to influence is this. You ready for it? What's the first sphere of honor? Who should you honor? Anyone want to take a guess at the first one? Yourself. Yourself. Why? Because if you don't know how to honor yourself, you will never be able to honor God. If you can't honor yourself, you'll never be able to honor your spouse or your kids. The first person you need to know how to honor is yourself. As we build this foundation for shifting culture, it starts with looking in the mirror and going, you know what, you're worthy of honor. Every person in this place is worthy of honor. Well, I'm a horrible parent. You were a horrible parent. Well, I'm a horrible husband. You were a horrible husband. Start honoring yourself because if you can't honor yourself, then you will never find yourself in a place where you can honor others. It starts at the home front every single time. So often we take and spend so much trying to fix the situations around us, but we don't actually fix us. When we see ourselves as we truly are, listen to this. When we see ourselves as we truly are, no better and no worse, we will have the freedom and security to honor others around us. Whenever it's no longer about a game, right? You know what? Whenever you can look at someone and go, I'm so glad you succeeded or that you made that achievement or that you were championed in that moment. When you can sit there and go, man, that is so cool. Go get it. And it isn't about, well, I I can't believe my business didn't do as good as their business. Well, you know what? They, They got more money than I've got. Their house is nicer than my house. Their marriage is working and mine isn't. Their kids are following God. Mine aren't. 
You can live an entire life trying to compare yourself and come up with an excuse for the apathy in your life, or you can wake up and realize that you don't even know how to honor yourself, so why would you be honored in in return? So the first fear is honoring yourself. After that, where is it? God. Because if you know how to honor yourself, then you can look in the mirror and say, well, God doesn't make junk. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and I know it full well. God, you're good at making people. God, now now what can we do together? Where can we go next? What's my purpose? Casey mentioned, what's my purpose? If you can honor yourself, you start seeing your identity and establishing your identity. Then you can go into the next. Hey, what's next, right? So you, God, what's next? What's your immediate sphere? Family. Family. You know, we've got broken marriages producing broken children, producing broken culture, which is producing broken governments. And then we sit there and go, oh, well, get out and vote. It's going to fix it all. Start establishing the structure of family. Start establishing the fact that you are actually worthy. It goes in this way. You, God, family. First of all, your spouse. Can I tell you there's no good family with a broken marriage? There's no good family with a broken marriage. If you're not strong, see, this is the thing. And this is the, I want to silence a lie in this room. You and your spouse need time alone to build your relationship. Don't believe the lie that you can't leave your children. Find a babysitter. Find time away. I can't afford it. Go pack a tent and crawl up on a mountain for three days with your spouse. It costs you little or nothing. Why? Because if you can't commit to the relationship of husband and wife, you will never be able to commit to the relationship of father-daughter, father-son, wife-son, wife-daughter. It won't work. Establish that concept. What is it surrounding? Honor. What is honor? It is that to hold in high esteem or great respect. It's treating others as you would want to be treated. It's looking for the good in others. How many people know you can always find something bad in your spouse? There is a couple brave souls that raised their hand. All the rest were terrified too. Everyone in this room can do that. You can always find something wrong with your spouse. How many times can you sit there and go, I'm just going to choose not to find the thing wrong with my spouse? Just overlook it. Hey, you know what? If there's legitimate issues, deal with legitimate issues. If there's petty problems, knock it off. You can always find something to be pissed at your your spouse about. And yes, I just said that word from the pulpit. So find out that honor overlooks the little things and deals with the big things and propels the relationships into proper function, structure, and scope. So it's you, God, spouse, children. When you honor your children, your children honor you. You might be like, I tried it once. Well, why don't you try it about 100 times? Why don't you try it about 1,000 times? This is the thing. Can I tell you something? One good parenting action does not undo 100 bad parenting actions. But that's what we, we believe this lie of, well, if I could just, my kids aren't good because of fill in the blank. Well, have you, have you actually been consistent in your parenting? Is your no always no and your yes always yes? Or do you promise and then go back on it? Do you sit there and draw the line but then let it be redrawn by your kids? Us, God, our spouse, our children, then our community. I want this. You want to shift culture? This is how it's going to work. When the world sees you and goes, I want what they have because it's working. Their marriages work. Statistics prove the church hasn't figured this out because the marriage divorce rate is so high in the church, it's astronomical. Why? Because we haven't figured out this honor concept. So 
So here it says, children obey parents, honor your father and mother. Fathers, don't exasperate your children, right? Husbands, don't exasperate your wives. Wives, don't exasperate your husbands. It works all the way around, you guys. Seriously. Wake up. Understand, can I, how many people are married to the polar opposite edition of themselves? Right? Yes and no. Okay. Well, I'm not yes and no. I'm not yes and no. Like, we are polar opposites. And it's amazing. Most of the time. (laughs) But no, how many times have you ever had your spouse say something and you just know they're right? No, it's easy for them to admit they're right. It's hard for you to admit they're right. But God intended that. He intended the opposites to attract. He intended your weaknesses to be their strengths. Why? Because of humility. You want to know the proving grounds of honor? Humility. It's needed. If you don't don't know what humility is, you will never know what honor is because you actually look at yourself as higher than everyone else. Honor releases fullness in the lives of those who are being honored. And it also releases fullness in the one who is doing the honoring. You want to build each other up? Start honoring. You want to build yourself up? Start honoring. Turn to Romans 12, 9. And as you're going there in 1 Samuel 24, it talks about King David, and and it explains this really interesting concept. King David was anointed king at a young age. Everyone know the story, right? King David anointed king. How many people would be okay with being anointed king and then sitting underneath the worst leader they'd ever seen? Did you know David killed the man who took Saul's life? Because he said, how dare you place your hand on God's anointed? Wait a second. Saul chased David for years trying to kill him. But yet David kills the man who takes Saul's life. Why? Because David knew what it meant to honor. David knew what it meant to sit underneath a flawed leader, yet honoring him in the process. God is calling us to stand in flawed situations and show honor. That doesn't mean acceptance of action. That means honor in situation. Do you see the difference? Acceptance of action would be like, I like $31 trillion deficits. They're cool. No, they're not. That's our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids that have to saddle up to that flaw. I'm not okay with out-of-control spending in this country. I'm not okay with churches that belittle people. I'm not okay with leaders that use their power to manipulate. I'm not okay with that. But that doesn't mean that I have the ability to not honor someone. So Romans 12, verse 9 says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Okay, can I just say something? If we could just inject 12, 9 into the political agenda of this nation, could you imagine what this could shift? Scott, could you imagine what we could do in Cheyenne? Sherry, could you imagine what we could do in Cheyenne? If we could sit there and say, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And then honor one another above yourself. To heck with your agendas. And your petty differences. If there's been one thing I've seen time and time again is people care way less about this state and way more about their career. Not all, but too many. So as we talk about shifting a culture, what are we really wanting to shift? We're wanting to shift 12-9. We're wanting to shift a nation where they sit there and go, you know what, I may not see eye to eye with you. I can find someone in this room who's polar opposite to me, right? 
A very close friend of mine is Representative Chuck Gray. He's running for Secretary of State. And the funny part is this. You want to know how much Chuck and I have in common? I went and show, he came over to our house this last week, and I went out and showed him my pickup project, and, and literally the look on his face was priceless because he's like, I have no clue what you're even doing here. Do you play golf? I'm like, golf? No, I don't play golf. I'm like, Aah! right? And then I slice it like 300 yards to the right. No, I don't play golf. but I can honor and respect them. I can show them the love of Christ. Are we all on the same page? No. Do we always vote the same? Not always. Does that mean that we discount or discard or cancel him? Can I, can I tell you where the, the original cancer culture came from? The church. We've been doing cancel culture for years, you guys. Oh, you don't believe like I do. You just can't do this with me. What? Oh, well, you know what? You don't believe in the gifts of tongues with interpretations. You can't be a part of this church. What? Oh, you, you think this or you think that? No, obviously, there's some things that Scripture is very clear on that have to be black and white areas. But why do we cancel? Why are we so incredibly insecure that we think we need to shift people who are different than us? No, I think that they probably learn cancel culture from us. The difference is this. The stuff we were trying to cancel was personalities, not ideologies. That's death, you guys. So in verse 11, so we did 9 and 10, but in verse 11 it says, never be lacking in zeal. Do you know what that, I love that scripture because it gives me an excuse to be me. Never lacking in zeal. We can be passionate, you guys. You know what I hate? I want, when I shake your, I want a handshake. And I want you to look me in the eyes, and I want you to have passion. Why? Because this apathetic, lukewarm, halfway world we live in desperately needs godly men and women to stand up and go, I've got something inside here that's going to change this world out there. And when we do that, when we live in this passion, we then can turn around and start injecting that love that's sincere, that honor that puts others above ourselves, that thing that is good. We then re we start looking like Christ. Do you think Jesus was passionate? You better believe it. Passion week. I love how they call it that. It's the final week of Jesus on this earth. You want to know how he kicks the passion week off? He literally walks into the temple and he flips over the tables and he builds a whip and he takes a whip and he starts whipping things. Now, my wife and I probably disagree on this. We do. But I don't know any guy that builds a whip unless he's going to whip some stuff. I don't think it was like, no, it was probably like, hey, you're in here, boom, you're out of here. Right? That's the God that I serve. He has passion and he has zeal and he is at a point in a place where he says, guess what? It's not what it meant to be. We need to get rid of it. Don't defile the house of God. Don't defile my constitution. Don't defile my country. But instead, we go, oh, we, we're supposed to be nice. I broke it, Dave. I didn't like gold milk anyways, okay? <sighs> It'll work. The zeal and passion that we have for this world 
is going to define who we are in this world. When you, see, when you meet someone that just is all about what they are, it's contagious, isn't it? It's contagious. You want it. When someone's like, oh, man, they're going for their goal, and they're going to get their goal. You want it. The world will spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the next tip on how to do something or how to get rich quick or something like that. You want to know the ticket? You want to know the ticket to accomplishing your dreams, goals, and desires? You ready for it? Do it. Well, that wasn't profound, Jeremy. You're right. But it was deeply profound. Go and do it. Get it done. Live with that. So 11 says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, the last part of this is incredibly important because how many people know that zealous people, passionate people, have a tendency of losing sight of the important things? Right? Because you're going to find... If you've ever been put into a position of authority or influence, people want to elevate you, not God. Well, God placed you there. Now you better elevate him as you're in that place. Without Christ, I'd be burning rod at a power plant right now. With Christ, I stand in a position of influence and authority and leadership. Why? Because I had enough ability to say, God, yes, I'll do it. Finally, verse 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer sharing with God's people who are in need and practicing hospitality. Let's break that down. Patient in affliction, that sucks. Right? No one's like, oh, I want to sign up for some affliction today. I want to not get along with my boss or my spouse. I want some health issues. Anyone want some health issues? Do you see what I'm saying? No one signs up for affliction. But this is what God says, be patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, sharing with God's people who are in need, practicing hospitality. And it goes on and it talks about blessing those that persecute you and all that stuff that we don't like to read, but it's good to read. But I really want you to know something, you guys. If we're talking about culture shifting honor, it starts with us humbling ourselves and going, God, what's the platform by which you're going to set me upon? When God gives me marching orders, I don't march, I run. I love it. I love being right smack dab in the center of God's will because you want to know what happens in the center of God's will? The best stuff, the wildest rides, the most exciting moments. When you can sit there and go, God, it, it's so much more than, than I could have ever imagined. And he goes, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. You're faithful? I'll take you on a journey. You're willing? Let's go there. Because that's the God that we serve. Honor always releases blessing into your life. Write that down. Honor releases blessing in your life. You know, this is the craziest. We got some time. I had an epiphany this week. You ready for it? What is the, what's the trend in America? When you turn 18, what do you do? Who, what, who just said what? What did you say? Buy a lottery ticket? And start losing money from that point forward in your life. You get a job, right? You either go to college, you get a job, and you work till when? What's the retirement age in America? 65, okay? Uh, It's getting later simply because money ain't worth what it used to be. And so you work pretty much your entire life for what? Well, that's not true. 
you work for money. Is that correct? Okay, loosen up. Everyone needs to loosen up and think with me and listen to me. Because this was, this was a, a, a zinger that I got. So the root of all evil is money. Wait a second. You're supposed to agree with that, right? Because that's what scripture says. Or maybe that's what you were told. Money is a tool, exactly. So the root of all evil is the love of money. And it also says you can serve two bastards, both money and God. But in the, in the original Greek, it was mammon, which is actually, if you break it down, is, is, is an evil spirit that is very much on a covetous basis or a need basis, right? Okay, so... What do we do from 18 to 65? What do we do? Work for what? Money. So if you are being honest, we work a 40-hour week for that many years, we are truly doing what? Working for money. Trading our life for money. So this this is the jacked up thing. The Christian mentality is money is evil, having a lot of it's bad. Right? We don't believe that because we've been t- speaking otherwise, but that's been, a, that's been a trend. But this is it. Instead, the church says it's okay to work for money for the rest of your life instead of having money work for you. Okay, I lost them all. Okay. I'll say it one more time. We say it's honorable to work the rest of your life for money instead of allowing money to work for you, which then frees you into your purpose. The more I'm researching it, and this is going to whack somebody out in this place, and you can call me and we'll talk about it midweek, but the more that I'm researching, the more that I'm studying, the more that I'm reading, the more that I'm realizing that God intended his children to be financially secure to the point where they didn't have to work for money. Money worked for them, and they get to work for Christ. Come on. And so in this place, as we're talking about shifting culture in the church, what we need to start doing is starting to shift this culture first. Start thinking differently. Start seeing differently. Start taking every situation differently because we are called to be an agent of change for the kingdom of God on this earth in a way that when the world sees us, they want what we have. Oh, you drive around an old beat-up Taurus. Congrats. I want to be just like you. Right? Well, that's honoring, is it? Okay, George Mueller, we were having this conversation this week. George Mueller was probably one of the greatest examples of faith that history has ever had. George Mueller ran orphanages in Europe, and literally there are stories. There was a story where he had the children set the table, sit down at the table, say the prayer, but there was nothing in the kitchen. Why? Because he knew that God would never leave him nor forsake him and will always provide for all of his needs. And whenever he said amen, the doorbell rang and someone brought in the meal. That's my God. But let me ask this, if everyone was a George Mueller, who would bring the meal? Okay, they're not ready for this. That's okay. We'll we'll do this down the road. But you need to realize so many times we idolize George Mueller. But you want to know what? I idolize the person who had the money and the wherewithal to listen to the Holy Spirit and bring the meal. Because we need those people. Those are the people who are sitting there going, yes, Lord. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. We need both. There are people in this place who will be called to be in poverty because that's what God's called you to be in. But there are people in this room that have been called to be multimillionaires and billionaires so you can shift the culture of this nation and provide for those that have taken the other vow. Don't discount yourself. Honor. The key that is missing in the shift of a culture change that we're called into. 
I started out by saying, I've had people say, I want to get back to normal. I want to define normal. I want to define it. What's normal? Watch this. This is normal. This is what normal should have always looked like. This is what we missed, lost, or forgot as Americans. We are at a point and a place right now where we have the ability to step up to the plate and completely revolutionize the United States of America and the Church of America with what normal looks like. That's our choice. We strike while the iron's hot. The people are ready to change. We have the truth, and the truth will set them free as well as us. If the goal is riches, buckle up. You will be one poor person. If the goal is the kingdom, buckle up. There'll never be a dull moment. Honor shifts culture. Let's shift some culture, you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, we come today. (laughs) It is so cool to be part of the plan. God, like I can't even begin to comprehend how cool it is to be part of your plan. So God, I pray right now that we would start understanding that the honor we show needs to start in ourselves. We need to honor ourselves. We need to view ourselves as worthy because you call us worthy. As free because you call us free. As righteous because you call us righteous. So God, let us honor us, and as we honor ourselves, then we can look at you and say, God, you are a good father, and I honor you, and I want to be a part of your plan. The greatest honor we can do is to truly live out a life worthy of the calling given to us. So God, let us be that. And then, God, I pray right now as those two things happen, we would then start just flowing honor out of our lives. And, God, what used to just annoy us about our spouse all of a sudden doesn't matter because, guess what, it's so much bigger than that. And, God, as we show honor and respect and love, then, God, out of that we we get honor, respect, and love. And then we do it to our children, and all of a sudden we quit letting the system raise our kids, and we start raising our kids. God, we start reading them stories about coconut cannons so they don't grow up and take away the guns of their parents and their grandparents. God, we start instilling worldview into our children so that they understand that this just didn't happen by chance, but there were godly men and women that gave everything to give them that freedom. God, they understand that the word of God is infallible and is sharper than any two-edged sword and it can divide to joints and marrow God, we know that to be true, and they will know that to be true because we're honoring parents in their lives. Then, God, let us be an honoring family core that revolutionizes culture around us. God, we can't fix this nation until we fix the families. Do we go and do we attack on the upper levels? Absolutely. But ultimately, it comes down to we need to start establishing godly family in this country again. God, I'm sick and tired of giving up ground. And I'm not giving it up anymore. So God, let us shift the culture using honor. God, let us wage a war that's biblically based and scripture driven, love saturated. And as we do that, God, I pray that the world would never be the same. We thank you. And we praise you now that we get to be part of the plan. And we say, God, you are worthy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you guys so much. And this is is what it really comes down to. What does it mean for you? It means you need to go and do something. It's it's, it's great that you're here, and I'm so glad you're here. But what are you going to do tomorrow? What are you going to do the next day? What are you going to do week in and week out? What shift and change are you meant to be a part of? That's where you need to just start praying. You know, maybe it's a situation where you need to go find 10 friends and have a conversation with 10 friends. Maybe it's a situation where you need to go out and and you need to run for an elected position. Maybe it's a situation where you're like, hey, you know what? They do do reading for kids at the... uh, at the library, and I'm going to bring my own books. I'm going to read this, this series. We'll, we'll put this series on our webpage. 
so you guys can find them and, and you guys can be a part of them. I'm going to do it also on my, my political page and show people where these are at because we need to take our generation back. So just pray, how can I be that change and how can I be that part? Amen? God bless you guys. You have an amazing week. And uh, we will see you guys later. Actually, next week, I won't be here. Uh, Casey and I are going to be running a tough mutter. Uh, so pray for Casey. Pray for me. Uh, no, it'll be an awesome time. Excited. Uh, an obstacle course run's been in our DNA for a while. So God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. And we will see you soon. DNA for a while. So God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. And we will see you soon. DNA for a while. So God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. And we will see you soon. DNA for a while. So God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. And we will see you soon. God bless you guys. Have an amazing day, and we will see you soon. DNA for a while. So, God bless you guys. Have an amazing day, and we will see you soon.